Okay, if I may have your attention, please. We are going to board and depart for hour number three. This is not going to be a fun and happy hour. It's going to be an hour of reality, a reality of unanswered questions, all the more are being answered all the time. I would like to draw your attention, if I might, to consider the splash art section at the top of the Rents homepage. Uh, look carefully at those graphs. Look carefully and click and review the stories beneath them. Uh, I'm not here to tell you they are 100% true or 100% false. I'm here to tell you that's what concerns me, and it ought to concern you very much. There is a great deal of validation right there in what we have been saying for all over three and a half years now. Uh, this is a story that's not going to leave us in our lifetimes or the lifetime of our children or our children's children. This is a forever story, and the Pacific Ocean is only going to become more and more deadly. They call it contaminated. It's radioactive. Look at the charts. Look at the graphs. On the right side, for example, you will see in 2014 the sea surface temperature right now. All right? Look at it. Look how hot it is off the west coast. It's directly off the west coast. And then below that, look at the projection of cesium-137 next year. It's a perfect match. You understand what's heating the water. This is what Yochi has been telling us. Yochi is off tonight. He's involved in a business meeting and couldn't be here and sends his regrets. He'll be back next Monday. The idea that radioactive nuclides can heat the ocean is something that the media will not touch. A great deal of the heavier nuclides, there are over 200 of them being produced and discharged into the ocean around the clock, by the way, are in the deep trench off the east coast of Japan. They have actually followed that deep trench all the way down to the southern hemisphere where the typhoons, well, the tropics, where the typhoons begin. And they are actually becoming more and more aggressive and stronger because of the heating coming up from the trench. They form right over the trench, the deep, deepest part of the ocean. Uh, the idea that cesium-137 and many other nuclides are going to warm up the eastern Pacific off the west coast is right there in front of you. And if you have been following the stories at all about the massive die-offs of first it was the starfish and then it was the sardine population which vanished and then the salmon fishermen a year ago said that there's something wrong with the fish and they paid for their own testing of salmon and they were very brave and very forthright. This is their livelihood. And the test came back very discouraging. Uh, the number of tuna now is said to be only 10% or less of the normal population of tuna up and down the west coast. So Mexico has outlawed the fishing of tuna. It's a, it's a collapsing species. I could go on and on and on. We've covered this before. There's one man and some friends. Uh, he is up in British Columbia right now on his second research investigation of what sea life remains along the British Columbia coast. And around, I don't know how many thousands, uh, 20,000 islands or 25,000 islands up there. But what Dana Durnford has done has gone, as they say, viral. He is up there right now with some co-explorers, and they are taking photographs, taking samples, making radiation readings on a much larger scale than their first trip, where just he and Terry went up and down 200 kilometers of British Columbia's coast on the east side of Vancouver Island, where they found literally nothing left in the tide pools at low tide where there should be tons of ocean life. Nothing. You've seen the pictures, many of you, you understand. So what Dana is doing now is launched, he has launched and is involved with, along with several others, in a 24-foot zodiac, self-writing if it need be, uh, another trip further up, much further up the coast, and we're going to be uh, talking to Dana and finding out exactly what's going on up there. And let me find out for me if uh, if he's online. Are you there, Dana? Can you hear me? Got you, Jeff. Thank you. I am. 
Very good. How is it going up there? You sound a bit tired, and I can't imagine you sounding any other way, given <laughs> the weight on your shoulders. This is a very big it undertaking. Is. It is, Jeff. It's really something. I'm worn out. We left uh, Banfield this morning. We went out and hit the low tide at uh, daylight. I got back in and bailed out, and there was a four-hour drive out the worst road you've ever been on. The 87 kilometers took us four hours, and so we're traveling at 20, 20, 25 kilometers an hour. It was really brutal, and, <laughs> and we're finally out of that area. We'll head on down to Yakulet up to the west coast tomorrow and do four or five days there and move on up the coast. We were up in the Dan Banfield. I think this is so significant that we, we actually got an omission of the damage to the ocean from Banfield, from the director himself of Banfield. Banfield is a marine research center, folks. And what they told me was that uh, the white sea anemones, now they get different colors, but they're the same family, uh -huh. don't grow on rocks. And, of course, it didn't only take me a few minutes to go out and look up all the dive shops. And then I went over to their YouTube channel, on YouTube, the... Uh, Banfield Marine Research Center, and I found pre-2011 videos of white sea anemones on rocks by their students. So, I mean, my goodness. They, and I went to their site, and they had purged all the white sea anemones. They have, it's called free, free uh, uh, pneumonia. They're called uh, plume pneumonia. There's several oh. different names for it, and all of them were missing. There was no research in 40 years on the most popular species on the coastline. What? This so, is a, this yeah, is so, Bamfield Marine Research Center, and they right. the guy is pretending not to know that there are white sea anemones commonly found up and down the coast. Is that what you're telling right. us? Right, and you get up to 500 in a square meter. They clone themselves, plus they lay eggs. So there's two ways they can reproduce, and they're extremely prolific. Every rock on the shoreline, my entire life of diving the coastline was full of white sea anemones, among many other things. And for him to do that and say that, I mean, that, that is an omission that they're covering that part up. But how, how is it possible that we lost all of those filter feeders? Well, obviously, that's Fukushima radiation. And there's nothing else can wipe out the entire species along the coastline and, and have the researchers say that it doesn't exist here, it doesn't grow on rocks, when that is its natural habitat. Uh, that is startling, truly startling. And another statement he made, which I think is really telling, he talked to those sea urchins. I used to pick 20,000 a day. And so we picked three inches to four inches only because the boilers won't touch nothing else. And he was saying we were picking eight inches, and we, we killed off the sea urchins. That's what he was blaming on me, not finding them, which is ludicrous, of course, because the boilers won't buy that. And if you did pick 20,000 pieces of eight inches, you know, you would have... Um, it, they couldn't sell it. There's no eggs in that. So what they sell with the sea urchins is what's called a uni. It's the gonads. It's the reproductive organ mm -hmm. of the sea urchin. So about 5% of the sea urchin is sold. And that's worth around $700 a pound, $1,400 a kilogram. Really? And so it's... Yeah, and the it's rest of it is just uh, made into dog or cat food or something? Right. Yeah, made an awful or something. Mm -hmm. And so for him to admit that, now, come out and try to explain it away after I tell him I was a diver working on that industry for many years, is startling because he should understand. He's an ecologist expert, and he has 70 universities that have researchers at that institution. And so that's a real high quality, extremely well funded, well, you know, a few hundred million dollars sunk into that since they've been there. And... They haven't got no studies on why the white sea anemones don't uh, cling to rocks there either. So they haven't got no studies on why it don't happen, and they got no proof that that is true. And the proof is, of course, by all the dive shops. You can you can you can type in folks Berkeley Sound underwater pictures. B a r k l a y b a r k l a y Berkeley Sound right. underwater Sound. pictures. Okay. Yeah, and you'll find all kinds of pictures of sea anemones taken pre-2011 by all kinds of tourists and divers and dive shops. And this and, guy uh, is acting like there students. just aren't any there. I, I mean, they, and they never have been. They just don't. That's right. not their habitat. This that's is it. This is, em, this is totally embarrassing. <laughs> just and I got say it, yeah, I recorded it. I recorded it. I never told them I was recording because I really don't care about these people. They, they have proved that they don't deserve any kind of... Uh, 
courtesy. Well, they're, also, working, they're working for the executioner is what they're doing. They're lying. It's really something, yeah. They really did. And they lied to me, of course, and that was a big mistake because I went and hunted up the information and posted. I posted that interview and he can't get away from it. But what it means to me, and you know yourself, is that here's the admission that Fukushima has killed at least that on the coastline. Yeah. We never found none of the Clintons on the coastline. We didn't find any periwinkles on this coastline. These are indigenous, just five different species. We didn't find, and, and we didn't find the, the whelks or the sea anemone or the snails or the, peri- or the periwinkles. We didn't find the very basis of what should be there. And so what's going on here is there are really concerted efforts to bury that particular fact, and that is our evidence. And so I'm not sure how to push that out there. Well, I've got, uh, we... Dana, I, I wanted to wait till tonight to have you sure. on. I'm going to put this video up. It's only got 1,200 views. We're going to push it much higher than that. Thank uh, you. This, this again, and I wanted to introduce it personally before I posted it this evening, later with the night news sure. batch. The director of BAM, B-A-M, Bamfield Marine Research Center, on the record, tells Dana Durnford that sea anemones do not cling to the rocks in Barclay Sound. <laughs> well, uh, it's right there. Another lie. Just like this reminded me of Dr. Kai Vetter at UC Berkeley, who has right. somehow magically been put in charge of the Kelpwatch 14, 2014 <laughs> study, and he announced the results of it before they had taken their first sample. And yeah, we got, got on that. Off yeah. Yeah, we got him, yeah, and, and he had to back off. And you see that this cover-up <laughs> is uh, is really not going well. But unfortunately, no. when you have the mainstream media, all you got to do is tell them silence, and you get away with this kind of stuff. But we're not really going to let them get away with it uh, no, uh, without making a, a hell of a try at, at illuminating the world to what's going on. This is an enormous lie. When you look at the graphs on the home page. Uh, folks, understand that that is not a one-shot, one-time portrayal of the cesium-137 in the Eastern Pacific. That's the way it's going to be for the rest of your lives and your children's lives unless some miraculous breakthrough in technology appears out of nowhere, which somehow enables uh, TEPCO or somebody to tear these bleeding, oozing, horrible, broken reactors out of the plant, dig down underneath them, and recover all the uh, spent molten fuel. You know, that's just not going to happen. And that's the reason I've said before, Dana, you know this, that there has not been one international conference of nuclear physicists, engineers, geologists, because they'd have to admit, basically, that they have no answers. And they don't want to do that, so no conferences. And then they have to admit that they lied for all these years and created that environment and that animosity towards people trying to flush it out properly. Because we get demonized, you get demonized, I get demonized, everybody that's even trying to have a debate gets demonized, but yet we don't, we're lucid all the time where they're not. I mean, when they say stuff like it didn't attach to rocks, and it only takes me two minutes to go out there and search it up and find it from all the dive shops, they really, truly ain't got a leg. They're in desperate mode, Jeff. They really are in a, in a most desperate mode imaginable. Right. And, of course, what we got done to them right now is we got to keep pushing that one. This is what's going on. People need to go down and look for the, the white sea enemies to really appreciate it. Now, we're going to start hitting all the native uh, communities along the way really short. We're, we're finally getting all geared up, all powered up to really do the job every day, catch two tides a day daytime and nighttime, look for animals. I've been out and made a few practice runs. Mm-hmm. Everything is working really good. So I went out, I seen a whale that blew right alongside me around 10 o'clock at night in the pitch black. Hmm. But I only seen one bird, and I seen two insects at nighttime, and perfectly still. And I turned the engine off, and I drifted along the coastline for a good two hours, and I, and I kept checking on the shoreline with the flashlight every five or six minutes. Right. And I didn't see any eyes anywhere at all. That was the strangest thing I've ever seen. No predators. That's where you always None. find them at nighttime, nocturnal. They'll come out like everywhere. They'll come down to the low tide line and lick the salt off the rocks, too. And so after two hours, I didn't see anything. 
My goodness. Th this would be uh, things like what? Raccoons, other small mammals? Right, and you get a little deer that lives on these islands. Mm -hmm. You'll get the otters or minks. You'll get, right. um, yeah, you'll get all the, the muskrats or anything else that can live out there on these islands. Uh, of course, the birds are out there. There are, there are a lot of uh, bats out there at night time. You'll see them out there normally feeding at night time. On the boat, they would come out and go after the insects by the light on the boat because we would anchor off the shoreline sure. over the years. When I was working on the coastline, that was a common thing to have happen. You see, and the bats would come out, huh? Yeah, they come right on out to the lorry alongside the boat and, and scoop the insects out of the light, huh. flying around the light. Pretty cool. They don't have any fear because they don't have any predators up there. And so you'll also see these little tiny reindeers, like whole herds of these little reindeers are probably about 15 inches high, and they got the full set of antlers, the whole no whole kidding. Antlers. Yeah, they're mini reindeers, really like real mini reindeers, so you can pick them up in your hand, one hand. And they're usually, because uh, there's no predators on those islands to bother them, even though once you get to the shoreline, there's lots. But because of, like you say, 25, 26,000 islands up here, these animals, are not they don't have any fear of anybody. So you, can, you can approach them really, really close. That's fascinating. And, yeah, we haven't seen any out there whatsoever. How many, and how I many, uh, how, Dana, excuse me, how many of the 25,000 plus islands have people living on them? Just a, a very small fraction of a percent. Maybe, maybe 100, 100, uh -huh. I would say. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, you know, I've been about 4,000 of them. Mm -hmm. Sorry? The, Sorry. the little reindeer you described. I have never seen or heard of these, and <laughs> it, it might be if they begin to decline. I know a lot of people down here who have some acreage would take them in and try to protect them. I would. Right, that'd be cool. Uh, that'd be cool. I would, too, if I had the opportunity. But yeah. That's what we were thinking, though. We, we probably need to start catching these guys and girls and, and start uh, thinking about stuff like that. We probably need to think about... You know, having fish farms way inland somewhere. Inland, and start covered, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, covered, covered. and uh, yeah. fed with well water only from aquifers. Right, uh, yeah. Yeah, if, if anything start comes up like uh, with these little reindeer, I know uh, people, and uh, I would personally volunteer to take two or three pair of them and, and try to get a, a safe environment for them. I know there would be hundreds of others, any kind of animal oh. like that, but especially yeah. something that cute. Would have oh, no my problem. goodness. You should see them. They're just absolutely stunning little... You can walk right up to them. Literally, they'll take stuff out of your hand. They have zero fear of anything because well. those islands, of course, there is no, like I say, no predator. Mm -hmm. and so they don't understand anything grabbing them. And you'll see them all the time. We're also going to be going up to Price Island. Price Island has a unique uh, beer population there where the beers are... The twins are one's white and one's black. They're, they're black beers. Uh, and so that's very unusual, and we should see a lot of them on that shoreline when we're going up through that. Yeah. We were, I was out in the, like I said, we was out in the nighttime the other night. I had the, all the daylight system for a while running to see if there's any uh, squid or any kind of fish would come up and approach me. Usually Everything they will. Like they will always come, like squid will come. That's how you do squid normally. I've, I've seen, seen it done. Squid. Yeah, yeah fascinating. Yeah, you, you hang a light, and they'll come up, and you can go, you know, until you got all you wanted. <laughs> Did when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in Newport Beach down in Southern California, and I used to go out on Newport Pier, and we'd, uh, I was 12, 13, we'd stay overnight on the pier, all night. Well, it was like well, a whole different world. Uh, it would get maybe. dark, and, and, you know, the evening strollers would come out, and then they'd go away, and, and sometimes late at night, midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, a lot of uh, Asians, Japanese primarily, would show up. And we didn't know what was going on the first time we saw this, and, and they would sit on the benches next to the, the edge of the pier, and they had buckets with them, and they knew. I don't know how they knew, but they knew, and they would put, they had a jig line with about six treble hooks, and they'd start jigging, and they'd bring up squid, countless yeah, squid. Calamari. They loved calamari, and they'd oh, take and the, the octopus, and they'd catch these things, and then they'd go home, and then we'd stay there the rest of the night and so forth. But what I was trying to get to was about a half a mile off the end of the pier, which is probably a half mile long, there would be boats, and they'd hang a light over the side, right, right. down near the water, as you know, and our listeners right. may not, but very bright right. lights. 
and they would you could see them dipping nets nets just net full right. after net full of squid out of the water we used to cast the nets too and but we done that where we done grailers we we bring them up with the lightning and grail them aboard and like you say this whole coastline is one of the most fascinating coastlines imaginable people really don't understand it I would go down and pick 20,000 sea urchins, three inch to four inch sizes. And that was 1% to 1% of what I seen down there. And in between all of that was every other imaginable life down there. Every square inch, every millimeter was teeming with just wonderful, gorgeous, beautiful colors into it. And of course, now we're not seeing nothing on the cameras. We're going to set up a VMO channel really quick here and when we get a good connection we're going to upload all our underwater videos onto the VMO channel and that oh. will I think will help people we'll yes, have it comparisons will. yeah we'll yeah. have comparisons and at the same time we're looking for research from the institutions that have already went along this coastline and hit these places and done a survey and so we're going to be linking all of that up like you say it's been a rough trip to get ourselves out it's all crowdfunded and we're so proud of everybody that helped us. And, and uh, including yourself, of course, right? Without people like you, we couldn't have been here. And uh, it's just it's amazing a, that we got this opportunity, uh, and we're not going to waste it. We this, uh, you, you mentioned you're, you're hoping to get uh, research from institutions. I, I, it'll be interesting to see how forthcoming they're going to be with anything yes. they may have. Uh, and then you mentioned also you had run across... An enormous photography project that had to do with documenting the the life on these islands that terminated in 2010. Is that correct? Just before the disaster. Right. right. And that person was also a real estate agent, and they're, I guess they were doing a lot of traveling. And it's just it's too hard of a site to use, so that's why I was going to turn to the universities and get their previous studies. Uh-huh. Like, I'll, I'll find them and patch them and hook them up to the original uh, finds that we got. That's the ultimate plan. Oh, I to see. To back it you up. Because, just... like, Georgia Strait had a 5,800 species, 5,600 species, but Banfield, Berkeley Sound, had an extra 1,800 species on top of those 5,600 that was in Georgia Strait. And uh, there's nothing there now. My goodness, we found the same disgusting stuff. And what was really unique was this morning we went way out, way, way out as far as we could to the very last rock. And we got in beyond. It was quite a surge out there. They had some bad weather. But we hit four beaches. And there was less as we went further out. There should have been more as we f went further out. And I got another good point I want to make before I forget about it. Okay. Can the you hold on? Uh, hold on, yeah, Dana. Would you? We have go to take ahead. a break. Uh, we'll take our okay. break and come right back. So less life, the further out you went. Okay, all right, we'll come right back and pick it up. Dana Durnford and I will continue in just a couple minutes. Sugar energy drink that you make at home. For about a dollar a day, you can benefit your health in a way you've never dreamed of. That's why the buzz. Join those who have made the choice for better health. Taste the drink that is changing lives. Read the testimonies at GetTheTea.com. Want to order? Need to order? Log on to GetTheTea.com. Appropriate name, I might add. That's GetTheTea.com. Or call 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. Say no to sickness and disease. Get your power of health back, but you need to order. GetTheTea.com. Helps with cholesterol, liver disease, Crohn's disease, digestive problems, and much more. That's GetTheTea.com. You're listening to Jeff nationwide and worldwide on the Internet on the Rents Radio Network. wish you could just drop body fat with ease? One man has discovered the secret to slim. How to turn on the slim switch in your brain, eliminating the need for willpower altogether. Do you know three forces govern your body and one secret, when applied, will turn on this slim switch as if by magic. It takes only minutes to apply. Personal trainers hate this guy. He's going to give you the formula that turns your slim switch on free, giving you power to gain control, reclaim self-esteem, and get the sex appeal you deserve now. 
Visit HaveASuperBody.com. That's HaveASuperBody.com. Head over to HaveASuperBody.com now. Get the secret to turn on your slim switch today and enroll in the free 30-day program that will transform your life now. In these often difficult times of constant danger and catastrophe, preparing immediately for the unexpected is now more important than ever before. Not only will we need to store food and have water, shelter, and protection, but we will also need to have a supply of common and specialized medications that could be the difference in life and death. In literally a few minutes, our entire social structure could be torn apart. The trucks will stop running, and everything from food to pharmaceuticals will vanish from the store shelves. So move to protect yourselves and your loved ones by going to confidentialrx.biz to find out what your medication options are and make the plans you need to ensure your safety. Go to confidentialrx.biz while there's still time. That's confidentialrx.biz. Okay, let's get right back to the program. And our special guest is Dana Dernford up in British Columbia. I, I don't know where exactly he is now, but he's been in the water in the boat. Uh, how many along with you on the boat, Dana? Uh, well, we had three. One had to go home because he's got a little baby for a week and another kid just starting school today. So he went home to catch daddy's first day in school. Okay. And so we got my kid here and my friend here. And his kid is home for a few days. He'll be back soon. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually back on the I'm on the boat now, to, uh, Jeff. I decided I'm going to go out in the boat. You know, that's kind of weird because I spend most of my life on the ocean. I don't really have an interest. But anyway, I got out in the boat, and I feel like I'm back at it again. I have no. never got off of it. I'm happy so for you. Cool. That's yeah. very nice. No, I'm, yeah, I'm real was, happy. Because it's safer that way with me. To, I, feel, I feel safer. We got all the equipment, of course. But yeah. I wanted to touch that point before I forget about it. Yeah. was in Banfield was a really unique thing was that we found a uh, little two and three inch uh, white sea anemones on the on the wharves, the floating wharves, but we didn't find it on the pylons of the big wharves. Huh. And so I was postulating how that could work out. It doesn't make sense because if you find them on the wharf, you should find them on the on the rocks. But he Absolutely. Said you don't grow on the rocks, but there was yeah. lots on the wharf. Mm-hmm. Well, what's going on, and I can assure you, folks, that this is probably 100% true, is somebody, because they have a couple of hundred students there, somebody went down to these little floating wharves and took pieces of a white sea anemone, little plugs, and put them on the wharf, and they grow about two inches every six months. They repopulated the wharves to they try to make wharf. it look normal. Yes, and because they, they couldn't do it to the to the wharf, uh, the piers, the big wharves, the fury wharves, yeah, but the ones that are floating is where we, we, we found them. And they told me they were there, so I went and checked, and sure enough, they were there. But there was none on the shoreline. So how is that even possible when it's these not, things clone themselves? It's not themselves? possible. Yeah, it's not possible. And not only um, is it not possible, I mean, that's the fabrication is what they're doing there. That's really, truly shocking. And there is no other excuse for that, see? You can't that's have amazing. Them on, not on the rocks, but have Because they're indigenous places, rocks, not wharfs. Wharfs haven't been around for very long. No. And this is what he was saying. Oh, they grow on chains. And I was like, I didn't want to say stuff. I wanted to try to get them to, to hang these. Well, I, I'm and amazed because you're showing, I mean, uh, in your video, which I'll post tonight at Rents, and you can see it at the nuclearproctologist.com now. But uh, you, you'll see Dana uh, narrating this video, and you'll see pictures of these white yeah. sea anemones all over rocks. Enormous. All over Berkeley Sound. Everywhere. <laughs> And of course, and this Berkeley guy Sound. looked at you with a straight face yeah. and said, "They they don't appear. They don't appear here. They're not indigenous." And he told me I didn't see him when I was diving. He said, "No, <laughs> you didn't see them, right?" He literally told me, "Wait a minute, oh, wait a minute." I let him go, but he was like, he was adamant I didn't see him, and I was like, "My goodness, man! You know, I, I can't take that away from me. I seen it I, every day. It drove me nuts. It was everywhere. It was wonderful. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I mean, if you could make a nickel off each one of them, you'd be filthy rich." And <laughs> Because you get 500 in a square meter. So it was easy to get at. But for him to say that is the admittance that Fukushima has killed 
something on our coastline, but it's much worse, obviously, Jeff, you know that, certainly, that we're only finding 12 species, and as we go out further into the open ocean, we find less? My goodness. I, I, that's my, like, so they're probably seeding the inside, too. They've been doing research on these islands for 40 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I actually got the research of them taking samples, and then they bring them back and attach them to the rock. And so they know what's going on in that in that kind of category. But we got all those students, too, that put out blogs showing pictures on the rock. This is a desperate move by these people. And now, it's like you say, when you post that video, that's the time for everybody to go have a look at it and really understand. And another thing about that, folks, is you go to the very bottom after you watch the video, go down to my description. At the very last link down is what it looked like underwater when I used to dive pre-2011. When you watch that video in high quality, you really understand, folks, why I'm so adamant and why I have worked so hard and why Jeff worked so hard and why everybody else is, you know, Yoshi and everybody else is, is really standing up to this this thing out there and we don't have the fear anymore because we understand that what they've done to us, yeah, it has to stop and we're it. We're the folks that got to do it. Well, I'm trying to bring the debate. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, Jeff, you has the, you're the guy who gets out there and really sticks no, 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 no. You're, you know? you're you're putting your life on the line too, and and this is uh, yeah. there are, there are there are a lot of us, and yet there are just a few of us. I got an email today from someone, bless them, uh, who was claiming that uh, Central Washington coast was perfectly normal in terms of radiation readings, and I have never said it wouldn't be, never. This is a slow bioaccumulation. It's right. the ocean is constantly becoming more and more loaded with radioactive nuclides. It takes time. This is not right. going to just all of a sudden one day overwhelm you and everyone's going to die in there in place. Uh, it's not that <laughs> kind of a thing. It's yeah, constantly that's a, that's getting a, worse. Cool. And what what you're saying is fascinating because the further out in the ocean, the more desolation you're finding, and it yeah. slowly works its way up. Are you still um, near Vancouver Island, or you you're north of there yeah. now. We're on that. We're yeah. It's going to take us another week and a half. Two. Oh, no, will take us more than that. Another two and a half weeks to finish Vancouver Island. Four hundred and sixty uh -huh. kilometers long, and we're, we're methodically doing each section that we can get access to. Now our next drive, the morning when we get up in the morning, we drove eighty-seven kilometers the day. That was too much for me, and our motorhome broke down last week. So we'll pick that up tomorrow morning. We missed. We got in too late tonight to get it. We got lucky on that. He's only charging us $250. Think about that one. Imagine that. Somebody with a heart? Yeah, it cost 650 to get it towed 40 miles. They gouged us big time. And then the guy who was going to fix it, we figured it was a timing chain or something, and he checked. He said, no, that's fine. Carburetor's fine. The choke was a little bit messed up, so he tied it back. So he put another battery and it fired up. So it turned out it wasn't the all net. It was just a wire. And so he told us all that on the phone. He said, it won't cost you more than two fifty. We'll find it. We'll fix it. And you won't have that problem no more. And I was like, my goodness. That's probably the best news I've ever got. I thought we well, were going to get hammered. You well, know, on a motor home. Yeah, they figure, usually right? take advantage of those people. That, this, like a uh, note or something. There, yeah, there are, st there are still some wonderful people out there. And you, you ran so. into one of them today. That's good. Well, I can, let's, uh, I'm going to play a little bit of this video where you, interview the director this guy is the director of the Banfield yeah. Marine Research Center all right he's number he's Mr. Yeah. Big I'm gonna play a little bit of this and uh, he didn't know he was being recorded uh, we're gonna uh, Todd will go through the break on this one I'm sure our sponsors will be happy uh, to help us out on this uh, this is very Thank important you. let me play a little bit of this so here we go sure, do you want to come in and sit down? can I that would be so grateful my name is Dana Durford I'm also known as nuclearproctologist.org. And so what I'm doing is a survey up this coastline, covered around 500 kilometers. And I understand the nuclear industry so well because of Fukushima. We're looking at the tidal pools in the nursery of the actual ocean. And so I don't find the white sea enemies anywhere I went, and including the, the launch docks. And I was wondering if you guys have any yeah, kind of... There, in, there's tons of them right off our dock. On, on, the war, on the wharf. Not on the rocks, though. Right, so so these would normally cover every single rock and every shoreline, the no, entire no, coastline. True. No, it, it is. No, it isn't, because that's not what we found here over the last 40 years. Well, that's what I... We documented that for 14 years as commercial divers, the entire well, fleet. Um, so you're saying it doesn't... 
We've got samples here from the last 40 years, from right, classes see, that have been done and researchers. No, no, I, I take your word for it. Yeah, no, I take your word for it. <coughs> I was just wondering, because I don't see them on the rocks, I only see them on the wood, and that's not what I'm used to seeing for six hours a day, 315 days a year, and mm -hmm. so I'm really perplexed. Now, well, it's not just well, here, it's the... It's what we're way. used to seeing. Yeah, well, it's, it's, that's what I'm saying. It's not indigenous, that's normal to me. I don't see any periwinkles. I didn't see any snails. No periwinkles? I'm not see well, we're seeing only the green sea anemones out here, just a lot of but them. But periwinkles? we got lots of them. Yeah, well, maybe you can... Is there a chance you can tell me where to and we'll go find them? So, which species are we talking about? We're talking about the 5,600 that are recognized for here of the marine, like the 600 algae to 770 Sorry, sea anemones. periwinkles. Now, the periwinkles in particular, I think there's five of them, is it, or six yeah. of them? And I know Berkeley Sound had an extra 1,800 more species than Georgia Strait did of different species that are indigenous to the coastline. Now, we didn't, we, like, normally as a diver, I find every rock is covered in snails, and that every rock is either covered in limpets, and that every rock that is not covered in that is covered in white sea anemones, and that we never even found them on the Fury Terminals. Or uh, you know, we're not seeing any major changes. The only major change we've seen has been the loss of uh, the three uh, oh. sea stars due to this wasting disease. Right, there's 70 species of sea star on this coastline. They're indigenous to each area, and you won't find them in the other parts of the Pacific Rim. And we found five species in 500 kilometers. We didn't. We found mostly purple, and we did find the reds. We did find orange. We found wasting. So, and now, when you talk, are you talking about Chrysaster of Cretaceous that comes in the different colors? Because those are all the same species. Right, but you you have 70 species that are recognized for the coastline. We've only identified five colors. Let's put it that way. Is a better way, maybe. Well, that's not the way to. Not now. We them. we haven't fit. Sorry. So that's not the way to identify them. Okay. So the brown, purple, red, and orange. Never found no ones, brown. Yeah. The ones with the. I mean, that's Chrysaster ochreous that comes in. Okay, well, he's playing his his Latin name game, and that's okay. Uh, that was that's pretty, I was letting him hang himself, and like he said, when he said periwinkles, you should have, like, you had to be sitting there to really appreciate how he done that. It was like, he was, it was a really high-pitched, little tiny, girly voice when he, he really didn't like me saying that. There was no, I heard it. was a reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah, so that told me something right off the bat. He didn't like that word that really bothered him. If you look up on their site, nudie branches, um, and they've done studies on the nudie branches. Well, nudie branches eat the white sea anemones. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, and so they haven't purged everything off their site, but they did purge everything to do <laughs> with the white sea anemones. So they allowed, the that's funny. Thing. Now, we used to call them nudibranch, but nudie branches, I understand. And right. that's the same thing. So on right. their own site, it says the white sea anemones eat the nudie branches. And right. so they haven't gotten up to speed yet in terms of removing that. This now I'm not saying this guy is or isn't, but if he sure. were uh instructed to put a lid on this and to cover as much as he could, he, he couldn't be doing up. a much better job, right? <laughs> well, he really smurfed up, yeah. No. I mean, you can't call excuse me and can't tell anybody it's not, it never grew on a rock in forty years when all the divers come there because it's one of the best spots in Canada and most accessible. And so there's tons and tons of pictures. <laughs> but what he is doing, I guess he panicked, you know. I don't even know why he let me in there, to tell you the truth. It seemed suspect to me when I was going in. I was like, oh, oh this could get ugly. Uh, but he was belligerent the entire time. He was fighting with me, and I didn't want a deck to go that way, and, and it's hard to talk to somebody when they call you a lawyer and say you didn't see something right. that they weren't doing themselves, right? But he was so very confrontational, you, absolutely. He was, yeah. yeah. He was a belligerent on top of that. But once again, he was adamant that I didn't see it, and how can that, that be, like me being adamant you didn't see something you've seen, and mm -hmm. that, would, that, would, no, that would be an insult 100% to you. Pretty like, embarrassing. Okay, bye, Dana. Yeah, that's, you know, like that's yeah. nonsense. Go ahead, Jeff, I'm sorry. No, no, it's just embarrassing. I mean, when you have to go to the extent of, of denying reality and say you right. didn't see it, you didn't see that uh, yeah. that airplane flying right over your head. It wasn't there. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. now, have you... That's have really you what he done. 
Yeah, that's that's grim. Have you had any more drones flying over? Speaking of things flying over, have you seen any more surveillance? No, we didn't see any drones. Um, we didn't see. We don't get harassed. The fisheries and oceans and coast guard they totally ignores us. It's just like um, it's just like we don't exist in one one sense where we're very. We want to have a debate, so what I'm going to start doing now, because I can't seem to get into the debates, is I'm going to go call ahead and book a place and have a town hall meeting. And so we're going to start that up here in Yakula. So about two days after I start diving, uh-huh. uh, not diving, but surveying the coastline, we'll take those pictures and have a town hall meeting and see if yeah. we can get people involved in it. And hopefully we can have a debate or even an argument. I'm even willing to do that with these people, if that's what it takes, just to start the debate. And I think it only takes one community coming on board. We don't know which one it will be. Uh-huh. But we do have a guy up in Tofino, Jeff, that you might like this one. When we get to Tofino, there's a man there who lived there for 20 years, and he went down. Now, Tofino, folks, is 900 people in the summertime, or 900 in the wintertime, 9 million in the summertime. They all go there to look at the starfish, the periwinkles, sea anemones, and everything That's else. a hell of a tourist site. Jeez. Yeah, it's amazing. And so he went down there and was normally every pylon on the wharf was completely covered with everything you can imagine, and it was no different than what I've seen in my pictures. And so he's going to come out on the boat with us, and that's the beginning of, of say, that routine. Mm-hmm. And we hope that every community, we can find somebody that knows the community, knows the ocean really well, and will come out with us on video for the record and just confirm you know, and so we're going to yeah. do that with the native communities because they've lived here for many, many generations, and they are used to eating traditionally off all those rocks out there. Mm-hmm. So we're really looking forward to that. And That'll once be again, fun. what we another thing we found, Jeff, was all the kelp, mm-hmm. the kelp weed, the bull kelp. Mm-hmm. It is all extremely on its last legs. In fact, it's like half of it is pure white and half of it is its normal color almost, but except it's a weak color. It's and the white? leaves are like colored yeah, it's white, pure white. And so like say a bull kelp is fifty feet high and so every three or four feet there's two or three feet of pure white dead. I've never seen never have, seen white yeah, kelp. I've never like seen it. it. I've never seen it. And I dove in kelp forest all my life. And I've never seen nothing like it. It's absolutely the most bizarre thing. The eel grass is the same way half the eel grass like, you take a strand of eel grass, half that strand is dead, at least, if not more. All the kelp out there was dead or dying. There was no healthy thing anywhere. And my my take on it after seeing it with my own eyes day after day, for sure, particularly this morning, was there is no life left on this coastline. Everything that is here is, is on its way out. Now, the, the sea urchins will normally crawl up the bull kelp. This kelp is not thick enough for a sea urchin to crawl up. But the sea urchins are ignoring the bull kelp, and they're only eating algae by the looks of it, because we don't see them. Now, sea urchin folks got uh, hundreds and hundreds of big needles sticking off it, and that catches kelp. And then they'll crawl on top of the kelp, and they'll start chewing on it. And what they usually do is get on the kelp, and their spines will hold on to the edges of the kelp, and they'll eat a hole in the middle of the kelp. Well, all the bull kelp doesn't have any holes in it from the sea urchins that we found, and we don't find any other, like we don't see, uh, find any of the Clintons or the periwinkles or the sea squirts or anything like that you would normally find huh. around the urchins. Now, the urchins also are important for the prawns and the shrimps. They like to live in the spines. And so... Um, uh, like the halibut and all the birds and stuff like that will fly, uh, swim down and eat those shrimps and prawns in the sea urchin shells. And that's why I pressed them so hard on the sea urchins. We only found a couple of little small patches, and we got good shots underwater, and there's nothing else around them, just the sea urchins by themselves. And the bull kelp that is there is not, is not eaten, but is damaged by some kind of, you know, obviously to me it's radiation, because uh, I've never seen kelp, and I dove, folks, in probably every harbor in Canada on the coastline, maybe less than 10 that I never got to. And I've never seen a kelp, huh. even in a harbor, that looked like uh-huh. this out into the wild. Uh-huh. This is protected waters. So, wow, right? I mean, just wow, it's all dead. And so how I'm, I'm amazed. Well, yeah, I, it's all dead. I go back to the uh, 
the email I got, and the the guy, or I think it was a guy, said that his his beach was full of life and and all that. I said, well, great, right. bless that, and it's it's going to go slowly in pockets. Yeah. There will be areas that'll be a, appearing to be normal, but if you really did a survey, you'd probably find be a lot of species right. missing. Some are stronger yeah. than others. Sure, it's yeah. it's not going to all go like a window shade rolling up, no. clatter, yeah. clatter, goodbye. It's not going to happen like that. So, uh, you folks, I would urge you to go ahead and take pictures. Do inventory at low tide. Look and see what you yes. see. And, and let Dana know. Let me know. Yes, uh, yes, yes, he'll yes, be yes. happy to post it, I'm sure, uh, yeah. with the location the of, of the... Yeah, we, we need this information. We got someone went down to the Botanical Garden here, and uh, Ken Robinson, I think his name is, and he gave me his phone number to give to anybody too lazy to go down themselves. And he's lived here all his life in British Columbia. Botanical Gardens is stunning, and he brought family and friends there for many years when he come to visit and show off the wonderful marine life. And he went down just three days ago. He took about 200 pictures, and I read his email last night. It's heartbreaking. But he didn't find anything. There was no insects and no life on the shoreline. And he was really angry, and he was literally yelling at me, why doesn't somebody, why didn't somebody tell us this, right? And he said, you know, like he wasn't yelling, yelling at me, but he was yelling because he was angry that he couldn't believe it. He went down and debunked me, and instead he was shocked and horrified that it really was so. And now he's an ally and an advocate for us because he couldn't imagine we were right. Because why didn't, why wouldn't the government have told him is how he seen it? And it took him going down there and looking at himself to really understand that it truly is like that. That we're not lying, we're not fabricating them, we're not misrepresenting it. And we're not spinning anything. We're just saying, my goodness, we need, we really, truly need to uh, have a debate, and not tomorrow or next day, but immediately. And it's not, it's not, you know, yourself. Obviously, you covered it so much that it's not, it's not a game anymore. It's not, it's not fun. No. And there's no every day is a horror show for us to go out there. How can we take pictures every day of nothing? I don't know, but we do that every day because we have no options. We have to do that. But it's disheartening to go there every day in the boat, and we go along the coastline, there's nothing there. And we're taking pictures of nothing, and you can see people are becoming disinherited doing this. And I'm like, don't worry, guys. Just You have to take these pictures. Even though there's nothing there, take that picture, because we need that. That's all we got to work with, and that is enough. Because if it's not there, it's not there. But the person who's taking the picture, it's literally the most boring job you can imagine. You couldn't get any worse than that for boringness because there's nothing to look at and it's frightening see and everybody right now at this stage after almost 30 days on the road are really shook by this they really they say and they get mad when you read a comment where people say this is not true or this is it's not as bad as that because they're the guys who are on the beach and they're sitting I, I listen to them they're outraged how can they say that and I say well they're not there on the beach they don't understand that you guys are seeing it with your own two eyes you can't ignore it but they won't look at the pictures. If they did, they might understand, and they might not. And that's why that video, the very last link under that one, Jeff, you're going to put up about the Banfield. That last link is pre-2011 from Banfield, and it's stunning. It's gorgeous. Um, unimaginable. It was like icing every day, and why some days it would make 20 jumps in the ocean, because you couldn't get enough of it. Just pure life, every square millimeter. And we're out there, and we can't find anything and we go to the to the researchers, and they tell us that they don't grow on rocks. Is oh my goodness, is an uh, Well, he yeah. uh, he had. Look, I don't I don't know the guy, and no. he's always welcome to come on the program and and whatever. But yes. he didn't yes. have he didn't have in his voice the sound of a man who was who was doing anything but stonewalling you with with latin right. names and and bs <laughs> uh, that's the way it sounded to me and yeah. uh, i let him go yeah yeah i didn't well, know how to do a proper interview like yourself who have done tens of thousands i didn't i didn't know how to do that see so and you did he, great you know, no you did me, just fine he wrote me pretty rough i was nervous of course but i'm not going to be no more right that was, that was the only one I needed to do to get to get past that little home. Next time I'll have the questions, and they won't put me off. They won't be able to berate me, and it'll be totally civil and totally lucid. Exactly. And I'll, just, I'll ask them all the hard questions, and if they, they, they kick me out, I'll say, okay, well, you know, you guys have enough 
nice day, and I'll leave, right? That's I'm right. Not confrontational. Yeah. No, no. No, no you're doing it just I right. I just want to get a question, right? Just ask yep. a simple question, and hopefully somebody will have a hurt. Well, you're going to find them, and the commercial fishermen, it'll be interesting to talk to them if you get a chance, and yeah. others who are involved. Dana, thank you very much for staying up late and being here. You take care of yourself. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll check in with you next Monday. All right, my friend. You have a nice day. Good night, okay. everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Dana Dernford, and I'll have that video up in a little while. we we'll get the late news together. Okay, well, there you got it. That's the latest. And we'll keep watching it for you. But uh, again, don't expect a, a mass end-of-the-world event one morning when you pull your Geiger counter out and check it. It's a long, slow build is what's happening. All right, we will be back tomorrow night, Tuesday. And we'll do it again. Thanks for being here. Take care and we'll talk soon.